everybody. First of all, well, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you for those who slept out last night. I think you're going to be really pleased with what we have in store for you today. And I'm sure, like me, you can't quite believe that it's been 40 years. I know some of you, not quite that long, but for those of you that were around in 1977, it is truly going to be an awesome celebration. When George Lucas first asked me to join Lucasfilm, I thought I had some idea of how thrilling and surprising and frankly emotional this was going to be, you know, creating more of an expanded Star Wars universe. But what I've experienced has really exceeded my wildest dreams. And you and the films are the most important part of that journey. Your passion, your dedication, and your love of Star Wars. You guys have no idea how that inspires us every single day. We consider all of you a part of the Lucasfilm family. And what an honor it's been to also work with some of the original trilogy filmmakers and the cast and crew, and also some of those filmmakers who weren't even born when Star Wars first came out. But the greatest honor for me is to acknowledge the man whose collective genius has brought us all together today. Please welcome none other my Yoda, George Lucas. Welcome, welcome to Celebration, George. Does that always happen when you walk into a room? Um, not like this. No, <laughs> not like this. So, firstly, thank you for being here at Celebration. Thank you. Um, I mean, it's absolutely incredible. We're celebrating 40 years of Star Wars. How do you feel? How does that make you feel? Um, Apart from old. Well, the, the shock, the shock was, I hired you when you were 11 years old. Yeah. And... <laughs> And now you have gray hair. <laughs> that, well, it's let me know what 40 years is. Well, it's the stress of the business, you see, that you introduced me to. That's what's done it. Uh, uh. <laughs> so, now watching that video that we saw, I mean, it, it brings back so many fantastic memories. The moments, the people, the fans, uh, and of course, among those faces in there, two faces that uh, are of true legends that are no longer with us, sadly. We recently lost... Carrie Fisher and Kenny Baker. Now, absolutely. Now, these were two people who were uh, inspirational to me in my early career. And um, I just want to acknowledge that we all love and miss them. And we'll continue to celebrate their legacies during this show today, at the event, and also beyond. Now, George, um, cast your mind back, all the way back to the early 70s. I want to know about that moment you first came up with Star Wars. 
Where were you? What was going on? Well, you know, again, Star Wars evolved. It wasn't, didn't come out in one thing. Well, there wasn't I, a moment. You were there, well, there was a moment, but it was like a, an idea. See, I have and ideas. the idea was more, I would like to make a, an action movie, which is more like a Saturday matinee serial that I enjoyed as a kid, mm -hmm. but imbue it with uh, mythological, psychological motifs, because we don't have any of those today. So I said, well, I'm going to take these two things and put them together. And again, I did it, and then uh, a few years later, um, I ended up making a deal with uh, United Artists. They said, what other movies do you have? Because I was making a deal for American Graffiti. I said, I have this sort of space opera thing. They said, okay, we'll do a deal for that. The one thing you've got to learn about studios is that um, if you, they, you get your break, you say, I got a script. They say, well, we'll, we'll do that, but we want to own you. We want to do all the films you ever make in the, in the world. And you say, well, that's fantastic until you get to the next level and suddenly you realize you've signed away your life. But so anyway, uh, it wasn't really until, because I wasn't even thinking about it. I was thinking about American Graffiti. That was the movie I was making. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then uh, what really happened was um, after American Graffiti, uh, the studio considered it to be so bad they wouldn't release it. So I was out of a job. I'd made one movie, which was a cult favorite, which I liked, but nobody else did. Yeah. And then I think they did. And, and then I did this other rock and roll film, which wasn't even good enough to be released. So when I went into the the world, there's this other side of all this, which is I say they want to own you for life. Well, if you have two films that aren't successful, they don't want to see you. They don't even have lunch with you. They don't want anything. They don't even know who you are. So, but in American Graffiti, uh, in an effort to get people to surround it, we had all these screenings. And what, at one of the screenings, the head of 20th Century Fox came, and uh, Alan Ladd Jr. And he just came up to me afterwards and says, I love this movie. I think this is the greatest movie of all time. I want to do your next movie. I don't know what it is, but you're a talented guy, and I want to make the movie. I said, well, I got this movie. It's sort of a space opera thing. We have, you know, I have big dogs driving spaceships. And he goes, uh. <laughs> That's a good pitch. He said, okay, I'll do it. And he followed me all the way through, even though the board of directors and said, what in the world is this? Wow. And um, right up until the very end. And he fought for it. And he helped me make it. And that's when I began to own the idea. Because I was still writing scripts. And any of you who read the books, you know, I took an idea and I was looking for a story, I was looking for a thing, I was looking to make it be something. And so I went through a lot of different versions of it until uh, I finally got to the one. And even when I was shooting in Tunisia, I was still rewriting. So, uh, you know, the idea was simply to do a high adventure film that I loved when I was a kid with meaningful psychological themes. And, uh, you know, I don't know what I felt. It was like a really cockamamie idea. So I, I did that, but it, you know, again, seeing the film tonight and seeing it when we were shooting in various places after, Star, after the first one, you know, seeing all the kids, you know, it's hard for people to realize, and I'm not supposed to say this, and I wasn't supposed to say it then. But, you know, it's a film for 12-year-olds. That's... But it, it, it brings out the kid in all of us, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, well, mean... it's, it's, it was designed to be a film, like mythology, mm. of this is what we stand for. You're about to enter the real world. You're 12 years old. You're going to go on into the big world. You're moving away from your parents being the center focus. You're probably scared. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen. And here's a little idea of some of the things you p should pay attention to. You know, friendships, uh, honesty, um, and uh, trust, and doing the right thing, living on the light side, avoiding the dark side. Um, those are things that it was meant to do. and. Obviously, the real thrill was when I see some of those little things, but I see the fans 
And we, you know, when we were in, in Spain shooting uh, Padme's Palace, you know, there were 10,000, like here, and they were all little tiny kids. They were reaching through this fence. It was a metal fence. It was like, you know, the White House. It was a, it was a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a national landmark, that palace. Yeah. And they were all leaking their hands out, even little tiny ones. They had no idea who I was, but all they wanted to do was touch my hand. And I said, you know, this is what I did it for. Right. Everything, none of it makes any difference, except... <laughs> you know, this, in the real world, you know, the critics, uh, certain fans and things, you know, they're not very kind. But when you see, but when you see all these little kids and you see the look on their face and Absolutely. what it means to them, it forgives everything. Well, you know, George, I was, um, absolutely, yeah. I was one of those kids, you see. I mean, at seven years old, I remember seeing Star Wars and I immediately fell in love with it. But little did I know at that point, four years later when I was 11, you would give me the opportunity to go to that galaxy far, far away and meet my heroes, which was incredible. Um, and since then, Star Wars has become an integral part of my life and career. Not a day goes by that I'm not talked about Star Wars. Somebody doesn't talk to me about Star Wars. Um, and I just want to have this opportunity now to say thank you sincerely, George, for all of the opportunities you've given me. And for making that small boy's wish come true. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, I've got a letter here, actually, that I wrote to you just after we finished filming Jedi back in 1983. Dear Mr. Lucas, my name is Warwick. I hope you remember me. I helped you make the new Star Wars film last year. <laughs> I hear that the film is being released in this country on June the 2nd and that a few of the toy shops in London have some of the new figures. I hope this is not too rude of me to ask, but would it be possible for you to send me the very latest figures and walkers? <laughs> Now, I was hoping very much that there might be an Ewok or Jabba the Hutt. I was a Jabba the Hutt fan, obviously. Uh, I did enjoy myself with you and the members of the film unit. And keep remembering what a terrific experience it was. Kind regards, Warwick. And, uh, <laughs> and here's a picture of the 13-year-old me with my wonderful collection of vintage Star Wars figures. Yeah. And you know what? I've still got that collection to this day, minus the vinyl figure capes. You always lose them, don't you? So, uh, <laughs> I've still got it all. I've still got it all. Now, an important part of the Star Wars legacy has been the stories told on television. For six plus seasons of the brilliant Star Wars Clone Wars, fans... Yeah. Fans of all ages learn more about the characters they know and love, but were also introduced to a vast array of new characters that are now fan favourites. That legacy continues with the critically acclaimed Star Wars Rebels. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Star Wars Rebels executive producer and supervising director, Dave Filoni! Welcome, Dave. Hey, wow. <laughs> Crazy. So, um, Who are you again? Yeah. <laughs> it's starting early. So, yeah. This is one of my kids. It's this one is of one kids. of my kids. He didn't start when he was 11, but, you know, he did start when he was very young. You know, and he I had a lot of bad, a bad ideas that had to be purged from his mind. <laughs> Purge they were, yes. Yeah. So Dave, I mean, George is alluding to that there. You've learned a lot from George, haven't you? Oh, yeah. He's, he's kind of a mentor, yeah? Yeah, I, I would say I'm really lucky, you know. I mean, listening to George talk about the movies, what you just experienced hearing him talk just now is kind of what I was able to uh, get for 10 years working on Clone Wars and their important lessons. And I would say the most important lesson there uh, honestly, and it kind of combines everything, is uh, he used to always tell me, don't be afraid. 
And to explain what that is to me is like, it seems very simple. Most of the big ideas you have are very simple. But when you're coming on board to like direct this major franchise that all of you love and around the world people love, it's easy to get overwhelmed by that and that idea. And that is going to limit you and more importantly limit your creativity if you become afraid of it. So you can never be afraid of things, to try things, to experiment, to do things that haven't been done. When we would find something that a lot of people would say, well, you can't do that, it's the first thing George would say, okay, we're going to do that. From the way that we produced the Clone Wars, which was not with storyboards traditionally, we did a completely different way. We had a program that George had been developing, and he said, we're going to use this new program. It's not tested, but it will never work unless we put it on production. I know it will be difficult, but I need you to do it. And we did it, and the show got incredibly better because of that. So, I mean, it's just a true thing in life, as you've always said. Just don't be afraid to make no decision out of fear. That's, that's the key. Well, George, tell me why you wanted to bring Star Wars to television. Well, um, I've done uh, Indiana Jones for television. And uh, it's a great experimental cauldron because there's not that much at stake. You're not saying here's a hundred million dollars, it's all on your shoulders, and the next four months, if you screw up, it's all gone. It's a way to be able to put out a lot of product, a lot of stories, and that's really why we started Clone Wars. I said, this is an interesting idea. We could do a lot of stuff in this. And so it really came out of the idea that there's a lot of stories there, and I'd like to tell those stories, but would never be able to put them in a theater, because they're not they're more interesting as a long form than they are as a short form. So that's why I, I experimented in television, both all of the stuff, which as I say, uh, part of it is the stories and be able to play with stories and do things that nobody would ever do. I mean, my whole life is, well, you can't do that. And Dave had to put up with the same things that everybody at ILM had to put up with. You know, Dennis Muran and, and those guys and uh, John Knoll, they all had to do, put up with me. And I would come in in the morning and I'd say, we're going to do this and this and this and this. And their jaws would drop and they go, and they'd say, oh, he's not really serious. He, we can't do this. And I'd say, you can do it. Come on, we'll do it. And we did, I pushed them through it and they did it. And they came through. It was like, you know. Uh, Every, everything, a lot of the things we did have never been done before. And that scares everybody because we, we don't know how to do this. I said, well, we'll figure it out. Uh, said, but, the, but, but the show, the thing, I said, well, we'll figure it out. But with ILM, we went from old fashioned visual effects to digital effects and created the digital cinema. And it was the same thing with um, animation. Um, especially uh, the um, Clone Wars, which we were trying very hard, and I think we succeeded in doing a feature quality TV show. The lighting, the characters, the animation was all feature quality, and we did it on a TV budget. And we were able to tell stories and expand the universe and bring in you know, great characters like Ahsoka and, and uh, that we would never have been able to have. So George, you're always raising the bar, aren't you? That's what you do. Yeah. You raise the bar and everyone else follows. You're always leading the way with this stuff. Yeah. So, um, so Dave, episodic TV, social media, it allows Lucasfilm, the cast and the crew to have a direct connection with fans. Why do you think that's so important today? <laughs> well, I am a fan, so <laughs> I mean, it's easy for me to answer. I mean, you look out here and the, the TV series let us do something kind of unique, which was we were on all the time, week to week. So we were able to give fans a Star Wars storytelling experience every week. And in today's media world, you know, they want people wanted to connect with us more and more and more and the actors on Clone Wars were really good about being out there, being open with people, connecting with the fans. It's a way uh, of you know making this the community that you see and uh, it's something that 
we respect at Lucasfilm. We know how much people love this, how important it is to them. So it's important to reach out to them and, and make you guys feel as much a part of it uh, as we can. It's, it's, I gotta say, it's been a real privilege for me uh, to be a part of this uh, in any small way that I have been to be up here with you guys, uh, you know, because I grew up watching your films. And the only thing I always think is like, your films must have really worked because I really got the message that you were trying to tell. Um, I've grown up when you see these characters like Old Myths and you say, I shouldn't do that, you know, because Luke wouldn't do that. That's the wrong thing to do. And that's the point of telling the story in the first place, is to give you that kernel of inspiration. Uh, and now uh, I do feel the responsibility to pass that on, especially once you taught me, Master, I will pass it on as best I can. <laughs> Dave, we'd like to thank you for all you've given to the Star Wars universe. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Dave Filoni. <laughs> now I've got a treat for all of you. It's a very special message from someone who wished he could join us here today. I think you'll recognize him. Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a good time. Wow, 40 years, 40 years of storytelling, mixing myth, mythology, legend, technology, in this extraordinary cinematic form. I'd be very honored to play Qui-Gon Jinn in The Phantom Menace. Um, I'm actually here on location in the Canadian Rockies we're making a movie, a very unofficial movie, about Jar Jar Binks and what happened to Jar Jar. Spoiler alert, he did go to the dark side. Have a great time, everyone. May the Force be with you. May the Force be with you always. Take care. The lovely Liam Neeson there. Thank you for that, Liam. Uh, now let's take a step back to the films where we learned... Always two there are. That was Yoda, by the way. <laughs> Please welcome Ian McDermott and Hayden Christensen. <laughs> George, George just said dark side rock stars, but <laughs> because of your reception, thank you. What a wonderfully sinister reunion we have here. It's fantastic to see you both. Thank Welcome. you, Elwood. It's really good to see you guys. So, Ian, um, George created for you some deliciously evil scenes. Yes. Do you have a favourite? Uh, of all the deliciously evil scenes, and, and there are many, in fact, I can't think there is one scene that isn't deliciously evil, <laughs> the one that stands out for me is in Revenge of the Sith, and that's when we all get to go to the opera. George, George will remember that uh, he wrote that scene originally in another office and I kept getting bigger and bigger offices all the time as I got more and more powerful because you know that's what happens. Um, and then he said, no, I think we should go somewhere else for a change. So we went to a theatre and the reason I like doing that so much, because I'm a theatre actor too, but more than that, um, Hayden and I could really sit down and from my point of view anyway, have an evil chat. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, George, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's one of the longest dialogue scenes in the whole of the saga. Um, and I was allowed to tell a story, you know, and really, really connect. Um, so that was exciting too. Fabulous, fabulous. <laughs> Hayden, 
Tell us what it was like working with Ian, a hugely experienced actor. Were you intimidated at all? Oh, I... <laughs> <laughs> Working with, with Ian was, was uh, just a, a real treat and a privilege. I mean, uh, everyone knows that he's, he's such an amazing actor, but uh, he's also an incredibly generous actor and, uh, and really kind of took me under his wing and, and, and uh, was just very caring and, and, and giving. And, uh, and I owe a lot of, of what I was able to accomplish in, in episode three to, to being able to work with Ian. Um, in, you know that scene that he's talking about was one of my favorites, uh, uh, and I just I remember just being so enraptured with with the story that he was telling that I almost forgot that I was acting in the scene. I was like, oh no, I got to do my part now too. But it was just it was you know he's so captivating in, in, in his work, and uh, it was it was amazing. Well, it's it's a truism that uh, older actors learn from younger actors too, and working with him was a great learning experience. I'll just say, the one testament to Ian's acting and how great he is, is he's the nicest, loveliest, <laughs> kindest, sweetest guy in the world. <laughs> he is nothing at all like the Emperor. <laughs> yes, well, maybe occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> So, Hayden, not only did you deliver a brilliant acting performance, but also your lightsaber battle at the end of Revenge of the Sith was epic. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about your stunt training for that final battle? Yeah, sure, of course. I, I, uh, I mean, all, all of the lightsaber work was, was some of my you know, favorite parts of getting to, to play this character and be a part of the Star Wars world. Uh, you know, it was just a, a childhood dream come true. Um, but I will share with you one of my, my challenges. Uh, you know, I had sort of uh, been conditioned from a very young age to make the sound effect when I'm swinging a lightsaber. Uh, and, you know, I know this is something that you and maybe struggled with a little bit too. Uh, but it was it was a difficult habit to break and i remember on a couple of occasions george you you would come over after we had filmed uh, a fight scene and you know in a very encouraging way you would say hey you know that looks really great but i can see your mouth moving and you know you don't have to do that we add the sound effects in afterwards and and i you know i was just so focused i wasn't even aware i was doing it but uh you know, still to this day, I pick up a lightsaber and I just, I can't help it. I just, wow, it just happens. So. <laughs> wow. Absolutely. <laughs> and these, these guys, these guys, you and, you and Hayden were so brilliant at it and they practiced every morning. Um, and I used to occasionally see them when I popped in to practice a little. Um, but the extraordinary thing about it was, well, every time we did the takes, there must have been about 20, probably more, they did the whole sequence, which was absolutely extraordinary. And when you see it in the movie, it's terrific, but necessarily it's edited and split up. And I used to say they should take their sabers, both of them, and get on the road to show how brilliant fighters they really were. <laughs> now, Ian, uh, tell us about your first meeting with George and how he described this character to you. Oh, yeah. Well, he didn't. Um, <laughs> George, George doesn't go in for lengthy explanations, which is great. We met very briefly over lunchtime with Richard Marquand. This is, of course, Return of the Jedi. And uh, I was very pleased to, to meet them both, thrilled, of course. Um, and then we said our polite goodbyes, and I went back home, and the phone was ringing. My agent said, you've got the part. I said, oh, well, that's great. Uh, what's the part? <laughs> and he went, you know, agents do leafing through piles of, you know, papers, and they said, oh, apparently he's called the Emperor of the Universe. <laughs> so, uh, so I said, oh, well, I guess we're doing it then. And, uh, <laughs> and from then on, it was makeup, hood, yellow eyes, and, and, the, and the script. And I think most of my information, and most actors would agree about this, came from the script. Although George was always around and very helpful, but of course he wasn't specifically directing that movie, that was, that was Richard. Uh, and of course I got to go on doing it, and when we met again, uh, before the prequels, um, George was there wearing a very similar shirt to, uh, to the one he's wearing today. 
And, and he said, oh, can we get you a drink? Uh, I said, well, I'll just tell. <laughs> no, no, it's just, you know, coffee, coffee, water. Um, I said, I'll have the water. And then he said, do you know anybody who wants to play an emperor? So I said, yeah, yeah, that's me. And uh, that was the audition for, for, the, for the prequels. And then he said, uh, there are two characters, the character you would play in this is, is Palpatine, of course, and he's a hypocritical politician, you know, we've all got to start somewhere. <laughs> And, uh, but there's this other character, and he didn't tell me the name, you know, he's in the background, he does this and he does that. And I thought, I'd really like to have played that other character. And then I got the script and I realized I was playing both of them. <laughs> and so did you eventually, apparently. <laughs> George, isn't there a story you were particularly taken with Ian's nose, though? Oh. Well, I... His, look at his profile now, it's, it's quite amazing. I think you deny this. When we... <laughs> when we left that very short and agreeable meeting, in the doorway, uh, you said, hey, great nose. <laughs> and, and I thought, oh, well, maybe, maybe that means I'm going to get somewhere. You know? Are you I sure? Said, I don't remember doing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, you did. You did. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you both for being so brilliant here today. And... Great. Good to see you all. For your Good. contribution Good. to Star Wars, ladies and gentlemen, Ian McDermott and Hayden Christensen. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, next we have a greeting from yet another member of our Star Wars family, who unfortunately couldn't join us in person today, but sends his 40th anniversary best wishes. Hey, everybody. Sorry I couldn't make it, but busy as usual. But I just want to say it's been a real honor and privilege to be a part of the Star Wars community. Thanks, George, for giving me that opportunity and letting me ride it out through at least three episodes. Wish I could be there so I could sign everything you brought for me to sign and just say hey to everybody in person. And uh, while you're all sitting there, I know you're all in my corner on this, we know Jedi's can fall from incredible heights and survive. So apparently, I am not dead. Yes, I have two appendages right now, but we know the long and rich history of Star Wars characters reappearing with new appendages and being stronger and better than they ever were. Mace Windu is awaiting his return. Let's make it happen. Kathy, you're sitting right there. I know you know what to do. All you gotta do is say the word. See you soon. On screen, I hope. The brilliant Samuel L. Jackson. Fantastic. So now I'm going to invite a few more friends to join us here on stage. Please, and I'm sure you will, help me welcome a protocol droid, a Wookiee, and the Baron of Cloud City, Anthony Daniels, Peter Mayhew, and Billy D. Williams. <laughs> Wow, welcome gentlemen. The last time I saw you three together, you were dancing up a storm in the Ewok village. And here you are. Yeah, and I'm still embarrassed about that moment. <laughs> so Anthony, tell us about your involvement in creating the original C-3PO suit all those years ago. God, do we want to go there? <laughs> um, George, you promised me, I don't know, fame, uh, glamour, all that kind of thing. And I had to take my clothes off to get there, didn't I? I had to stand naked whilst people threw plaster at my body to make a statue of me. Do you know how that disgusting that was? It was pretty bad. But eventually, do you remember Liz Moore, the sculptor, who took the, my body and then put clay on it and made all the shapes? And then you and other people, it was all made in plastic and whatever. And you used to come and stand in front of me and then poke the knee and say, why doesn't that work like that? Or why doesn't that, you know, the elbow? You were totally involved. And then one day, there were like six 3PO faces. There was like a, a Roman face and a kind of alien face. And the, 
they were all great made in clay and then there was one at the end and I said well I like them all except that one and you went oh that's the one we're having <laughs> Remember. Did you do that on purpose because yeah. you knew he liked that one? Was that the one no, you I really liked? Like that's where he chose it. The gold was the best one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was good. One. It was the gold one, yeah. But it was grey at the time, it looked kind of weird. But it worked out really well and I'm, I'm very grateful for your kind of input. Because you had the whole film and yet you would come and, and sort of say, mm, that's not right, or you know, you'd fiddle with it. And it was your idea to make it all Art Deco, wasn't it? Why was that? What? The rubber metal? Mm. No, the, the whole deco look. Well, it comes from a long tradition of robots throughout history. Oh. Like th there was one other. But, um, you know, it's, it's the, the key to your, the construction of you was the fact of the face. The face had to be absolutely neutral so that you could act and your acting would come through and it wouldn't be counter to what your face was doing. So by having your face be completely neutral, everything you did in your movements, uh, which is why I hired a mime, because the acting was in the phys physicality of it, so that that was a, the, it was very hard to come up with a face that was completely neutral. You know, you walk in and you say, well, I th what is he thinking? Nothing. <laughs> you know? And as soon as you were in it, suddenly this whole personality was there and this whole character was there and everything was there. And it yeah. wasn't against the... And as a result of, uh, of your brilliant performance, you are the sorry, only I didn't, actor... I didn't hear I'll say it again. As a result of your brilliant performance... Yeah. <laughs> you can leave through the dock door, it's nice and large. Um, <laughs> I'll see you after. As a result of that performance that you gave, that they all enjoyed, um, you are the only actor to have featured in all the Star Wars movies. Yeah. yeah. Now, please tell us your favourite memory from working on those films, perhaps related to this gentleman over here. Well, there, there are so many. You know, being backstage listening to everybody's stories is, is brilliant and very, very touching. Um, one, one does come to mind. Do you remember how kind of um, flummoxed I was when it turned out on set on the first day that whereas I've been reading all the scripts and R2 says this, 3PF says this, R2 replies, but, and there was nothing. And I was kind of like, uh, oh. Um, and eventually I said to you, George, when I finished my line, could you like make a sound? Could you like go beep? And you went, sure. Oh, beep. Um, and I decided I was better off on my own, George. <laughs> but, but do you remember that? But many years passed, and in fact, many films passed, and there we were flying out to Death Valley to go on the road to Jabba's Palace. Do you remember? Right. Little aeroplane. And they were setting up this, this box with uh, a, a mirror, uh, a window in it to make the matte painting of Jabba's Palace. And whilst they were doing that, I kind of, you know, walked along, sort of going, um, Lando Calrissian never returned from this awful place. And suddenly behind me it was, beep, 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 beep. And there was you going, beep, 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 beep. <laughs> it was the cutest moment ever. I just loved it. <laughs> so, Peter, yeah. the mighty Chewbacca there, a beloved character. <laughs> Tell me, Peter, how are you and Chewie similar? Um, well, we're the same height, for starters. Good answer. And I have blue eyes, which was specific on a certain gentleman's drawings. Right. So, um, but what I, I mean like, is, do you, I, do you share any of Chewie's characteristics? Anything that he, he any of his skills? Perhaps? Yeah, I, I, I can, I can maintain the Falcon. Can you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You take three plugs out and drain the oil. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot of chewy, um, and the way I looked at it was that it was a um, mime character that our clever departments would put all the down in afterwards, yeah. and it worked very, I think it worked very well. Well, I think we'll all agree here that chewy wouldn't be chewy without you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Now, Peter, you had a very special relationship with Carrie Fisher. Yeah. Um, what's your uh, favourite memory of Carrie? Uh, my favourite memory is she was she's a hell of a rebel, but she's also a beautiful princess. Oh. Think about that. Oh, that me. George, what was your inspiration for Chewbacca? Uh, well, the, the stories were all true, which is I had a large dog named Indiana. It was a Malamute, Alaskan Malamute, and he would ride around in the car in the front seat. Not driving. Not driving. No. Uh, and, you know, I loved that image of driving with his large... Because he was when he sat in the car, he was bigger than I was, and uh, so that was where I said that would be a fun character for Star Wars. And um, originally, he was um, the uh, originally the Ewoks were, I mean the Ewoks, the Wookies were what the Ewoks became, which is they didn't they weren't technical at all; they were primitive. But then, as I moved along, and I realized I had to cut the Wookiees out of the end of the movie, I decided to save one and make him the co-pilot. And uh, that's really how he ended up with his starring role. Wow. <laughs> that's incredible, isn't it? Out of, out of kind of, out of accident comes something so brilliant. Yeah, yeah. that's marvelous. So, Billy D. Williams. Welcome to Celebration. Yes, sir. So as Lando Calrissian, what was it like for you to join an already established cast? You were the new I, boy on the block. I had a really good time. Everybody, everybody was wonderful. And I especially uh, liked uh, visiting the uh, people behind the scenes. That was a very special experience uh, for me, besides working with the, these wonderful uh, actors. Um, so were you a fan of, of Star Wars before you were involved? Well, I was a fan of uh, THX um, 1138, uh, 38, no, 1138. Yeah. yeah, and uh, that's when I got turned on to George Lucas. And so I was, uh, so, and, you know, at that particular time, uh, there were all of these wonderful young filmmakers that were changing the face of cinema. And uh, George certainly was at the helm of, of that whole uh, period. And so for me, I was pretty established as more so than most of the actors that were in the film. And uh, I was doing some interesting things with my life and my career. And so when I had the opportunity to uh, work with George Lucas, I mean, I thought that was like going straight to heaven. <laughs> That's fabulous. That's no, fabulous. I seriously, seriously, uh, it was uh, a, a wonderful, uh, extraordinary experience that I'm uh, very happy to have had. Wow, no, it is. Um, now, Lando is, is a very smooth character. Did you bring a lot to the character? Is that a lot of Billy D. Williams in there, or did George say you this is how it should be? How did George that and Irv Kirshner and. Uh, but the thing is, the two components, uh, the cape, oh yes, <laughs> and Calrissian, an Armenian name, I A N, and I thought, wow, that's interesting. Let me play around with this whole idea because I didn't want to do a kind of uh, stereotypical, cliche kind of character. I wanted to bring something, uh, uh, something really special to it. Uh, something bigger than life. Well, you certainly did that. You certainly did that. Now, George, it must feel pretty rewarding to be surrounded by one, two, three, dare I say, four of your greatest character creations. <laughs> Why don't we go crazy and make it five? Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Hamill!
Mark and Mark. <laughs> so, Mark, what does it mean to you to be here at Celebration? We're celebrating 40 years of Star Wars as well. Uh, well, I can never get over the fans. They are supportive. They're with you in good times, bad times. They're more supportive than my actual family. They <laughs> criticize me all the time. <laughs> but listen, to be honest with you, meeting you and hearing your stories and how the movies affected your lives or inspired you or you met your future wife or husband, the way it's being passed down to the next generation, it, it's really moving. And, uh, certainly nothing I have ever taken for granted. I'm always just stunned that the passion that has lasted all these years. George, what was it about this guy that made you say, this is Luke Skywalker? What qualities did Mark have? I'm not sure I want to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we did a lot of testing for a year. A year? A year. A year of sitting in a little room with, you know, talking to actors every five minutes and then weeding those out and weeding them out and eventually having them do readings in the room and then uh, uh, we went on and then we did screen tests and we did the screen tests uh, with all the sort of finalists for all the th three main characters and so and we would mix them so uh, I think we had maybe two or three of each of you and you would each test with another person until so we found the combination of the group that worked the best together mm. the, the group that was like ready to be an ensemble and that played it uh, you know as old friends because I was trying to get that even though they start out not knowing each other I wanted to have the chemistry of them working together um, built in and uh, that and the fact that he was shorter than I was. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to talk him out of that line. Did you really have to say that to him? was short for his arm, Joker. Well, I know. It's oh, funny I, you should say well, that. I, I, I like short people. <laughs> no, yeah, look. That's why you hired me. Look, here's, 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 here's the secret right here. I can't even reach the floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got long legs. <laughs> It's funny you should talk about that audition, because uh, I believe we have a clip of that right now. Let's take a look. Here is their greatest defense. I doubt if the actual security there is much greater than on Apple or Sullis, and what there is is most likely directed towards a large-scale assault. So you begged George to cut that line, didn't you? Well, the, what it was was, when I read it, intellectually understood what it was. Now, I've never forgotten this after all these years. But we can turn back. Fear is their greatest defense. I doubt if the actual security there is any greater than it was on Aquilae or Stellas. And what there is is most likely directed towards a large-scale assault. Huh? Listen. So it, it makes sense. Fear is their greatest defense because they're intimidating this gigantic uh, contraption. Uh, I doubt if the actual security there is any greater than it was on Aquilae or Stellas, two made-up planetoids, I get that, uh, and, and uh, what there is is most likely directed towards a large scale assault. In other words, they're waiting for an armada. We could slip in in this little tiny hamburger shaped uh, Millennium Falcon thing. So it made sense intellectually. The trick was how can you make it sound like it's spontaneous dialogue that's just rolling off, the, off your tongue? <laughs> well, not, not so easy. I was going to say, he's, uh, uh, he was right. Uh, it, it wasn't much, a bit much, uh, although it's stuck in your brain. You it's stuck in my it. brain. I've never been able to get rid of it. It's, but it was one of those lines up there with, uh, it'll take a few moments for the Navicu to calculate the coordinates. the coordinates, or I'm, you know, I'm here to send you the message that the one Carrie does all the right. time, which is, the, but it was the one that actually said, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, it eventually went away. We never even shot it for 
when we actually went over. Yeah, I think I think the scene itself got cut out. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was my favorite because I loved Harrison. I said, "Look what Harrison has to say. It'll take a few moments for the navigator to calculate the coordinates. He'll never do it." <laughs> we were making book on whether he'd be able to actually say it. <laughs> well, you know, I'm sitting here as Warwick Davis, but also a fan. And, and I, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when we've got George Lucas here, we've got C-3PO, we've got Lando Calrissian, we've got Chewbacca, and Luke Skywalker. I mean. It doesn't get much more epic than this, does it? Or actually, maybe it does. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Harrison Ford! Take a few minutes to calculate the coordinates. <laughs> no, 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 no. We'll start from. Left out the it, it, take, computer. take a few minutes for the Navic computer to calculate the coordinates. Wow. I said to George, you can type this stuff, stuff <laughs> but you can't say it. Move your mouth while you're talking while you're typing it and I couldn't say it. It took me like 15 takes uh, uh, Harrison, to it's say such it. a pleasure to see you and uh, thank well, you for It's a pleasure to see you. At your first celebration. That's one. Um, now, I can't believe we managed to keep it a secret considering you landed your plane on I-4. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but it was a good landing. <laughs> uh, how did Star Wars impact you 40 years ago? What does it mean to you today? Oh, it's made no difference in my life whatsoever. <laughs> I, it was the beginning of an uh, of, uh, incredible ride. Actually, it wasn't the very beginning. The very beginning was also with George, and it was... Uh, a part in American Graffiti, and then... And then I went back to doing carpentry work. <laughs> and, uh, and then along came uh, George once again, uh, pulled me up uh, by my bootstraps and put me to work in an extraordinary uh, event that we all celebrate. And... Um, it's, it's been a good ride. Absolutely. So George, tell me, what was it about Harrison that initially drew you to him as an actor? Oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, in American Graffiti, I could see, you know, that he was a real talent. And he didn't have much of a part. Bob Falfa. So, um... <laughs> He was uh, actually working with uh, uh, other carpenter. American Graffiti wasn't a big hit for him. Uh, he, uh, you know, he uh, had to go back to work. Later, I found out it was the casting director that said, "Here, sit out right out in front of the office and pretend like you're building something." Oh, rubbish! <laughs> <laughs> no, I was actually installing a door for uh, for. Um, uh, 
for Francis Ford Coppola uh, as a favor to his art director who had uh, built the door, couldn't find anybody to install it. And I said, I'll do it, but I'm only going to do it at night because I uh, don't want all people walking through the air while I'm trying to do the thing. And one morning, um, in walked, uh, while I was finishing up the door, in walked um, George with Richard Dreyfus. Huh? With Richard Dreyfus, remember Richard Dreyfus? Yeah, but but uh, it was also I was working with uh, with uh, Brian De Palma, so he was in that room with me. You remember oh, him? no, I uh, didn't want you to be in charge. No, I don't remember that. But I but I walked in and uh, George walked in, which was a surprise, and he was uh, having I thought it, it was an interview for. Uh, for a new science fiction film. Anyway, we just chatted and said hello. But the, the story has gotten a little warped. I was actually there working. Yeah. No, I, I wouldn't sit out in front and wait for you, George. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I love you, but I, but I don't wait out in front. You were working. I was working, making a living. And happily I still am. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, we got and thank you very much. They got the part because in the end. I asked him, I said, uh, you know, this is about spaceships and flying and stuff like that. And I, says, I said, do you know how to fly? Yeah. <laughs> I said, fly, yeah. <laughs> Land. <laughs> yeah. He's acting, but how was his carpentry? But how was his carpentry? It's just special. Uh, it, it, you don't notice it until it's, you're shooting. Right. It, it, you know, you can have the most brilliant uh, cast in the world, but they have a story to tell. And the story that we had to tell was more than sufficient. It was full of... Um, humor and emotion and conflict and, and it was a it was a brilliant uh, invention of a of a mythology that uh, that has sustained interest for <laughs> over 40 years and and that's made up of whole cloth uh, out of whole cloth by uh, by by George and an actor without a story to tell is you know might as well go home so it was a brilliant opportunity for all. Well, certainly for me and on behalf of all the fans here in the room and throughout the world watching via live stream, thank you, each and every one of you, for your contribution to Star Wars. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Mayhew, Billy D. Williams, Anthony Daniels. Thanks, everybody.